Well, it, it really started in uh, 1986, 1987, when I was a visiting fellow at the Harvard Law School. And I had completed a book on the history of criminology, where I had interviewed criminologists from the period of 1930 to 1960 about their lives and work and their influence on the field. And I was curious about Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck. Uh, both Rob and I had, had read about them in graduate school, knew of their work, but I was curious about whether or not there'd be something there for an intellectual biography. So I went to the Harvard Law School Library to the manuscript division and asked what papers they had from the Glucks. And it turns out that they had, because the Glucks were at Harvard Law School, Sheldon Gluck was a professor there and, and uh, Eleanor Gluck was a research associate uh, on, his, on, on the project. And so they had about 90 feet of their papers, manuscripts, letters, correspondence, what ha everything related to them. And I asked, whatever happened to their data? Because they had done four longitudinal studies. And the uh, little white-haired archivist said, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by data, but let me show you what we have in storage in the sub-basement. And she took me down to the sub-basement of the Harvard Law School Library, opened up this storage room, and there were boxes of data from the original project. So I remember calling Rob. Uh, Rob and I went to graduate school together, and I said, Rob, I discovered this uh, treasure. Uh, let me keep searching for a data tape, and we could write an article. Hmm. Quick and dirty article. Right, we thought it was going to be one more article. <laughs> uh, quick and dirty article on, on the Glucks. And uh, needless to say, there was no data tape. And what I was struck by was how rich the data were. Uh, for the unraveling juvenile delinquency study alone, there were, for the delinquent boys, the 500 delinquent boys, there were 55 boxes of data, 12 by 15 cartons. So basically every case had about a this thick of materials. And Rob and I began looking at this material and through the help of the grant from the National Institute of Justice, got money to actually code the Gluck data, and we really reconstructed the data archive and created a database that could be used with modern statistical techniques. And that's really how the project started. But it, it really was motivated by the initial question was, um, what role do families play in crime? But then what was happening outside of criminology was books were focusing a lot of attention on families and particularly child rearing as being important. And we were both attracted to that, but at the same time, we wondered if, if childhood temperament and childhood socialization was all that was needed to really explain crime over the life course. And so we began to develop a, an age-graded theory of informal social control, and we used the reconstructed Gluck data to test that theory. When I first went into the archives at the Murray Center and looked through the raw materials that they collected, I was frankly stunned. It just went on for... I mean, you almost had to go up on a ladder to get to the top, you go down, and the files themselves were rich with material. It wasn't just standardized tests or the kinds of questions that we're used to today, but it was detailed information. They took notes when they went to the house, what the condition, whether the screen was falling off the door, what were the people like. They talked to neighbors, they interviewed teachers, they, psychiatrists assessed the kids. <clears throat> there was official records. It was an incredible... Um, scenario and we were we were awed by the data and so we used the initial data tape which as John noted was originally thought by us to be well <clears throat> this will be a, a a paper and analysis and in fact we did write a paper on that but having been overwhelmed by the possibilities in the data we undertook a what, what turned out to be a long-standing effort we we were I think much too optimistic <laughs> initially in terms of what it would take to reconstruct or recast the data um, as you noted, there were some important debates going on in the field at the time that also motivated us about age and crime, criminal careers, the influence of early behavior versus later behavior. And our work eventually took seriously the early behavior, but then shaded into an emphasis on the notion of turning points, or as the title, subtitle of Crime in the Making was, pathways, pathways that are set relatively early, and turning points through life, how people change. And that body of work um, was also <clears throat> influenced by debates at the time, although coming not out of criminology, but life course itself. 
So Glenn Elder, Jr., a leading sociologist of the life course, had published a number of important works, including Children of the Great Depression. And he, too, had taken the data and sort of recast it. So we were very influenced by his work. We talked with him. He was very helpful to us, in addition to criminologists such as L. Blumstein and, and others at the NIJ crime control meeting. So all that was influential intellectually um, as a motivation, but then the data, too. And we just forged forward, never looked back.